Now that you found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. Promise you joy in the mystery. Dr. Marissa, also known as the Asian Oprah. Her mission, to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, laugh, love, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Pay. Welcome. <laughs> you are tuned into my weekly talk radio show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Tuesday at naturally high noon out of the Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood, California on Universal Broadcasting Network. And then every Thursdays at 7 and Saturdays at 1 on my syndicated CNBC news radio channel KCAA AM 1050 FM 106.5 and now everywhere and all the time on iHeartRadio. And this is a show about hope and happiness and how you can be happy 88% of the time. So there's no gossip, no scandal, and no K-words. No Kardashian talk at all. And no CNN, no constantly negative news, because I want you to focus on your own reality show and how you can be the best that you can be. And so we have lots of different guests and topics to that end. And if you've missed any of them, I've had guests like Marianne Williamson, Marianne from Gilligan's Island, uh, Keiko Matsui, jazz keyboardist on Billboard, to Lisa Nichols a couple weeks ago, to Tony Tennille from The Captain and Tennille. Uh, I've got it for you, so please do go to YouTube if you've missed any of those shows and keep it tuned here. And today I I am continuing my fabulous wisdom series with more wisdom teachers. And if you remember, I celebrated my 200th show with a fabulous, powerful panel of Neil Donald Walsh, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, and Bishop Carlton. And I thought I would follow that up. It's um, more than 200 shows now. Uh, with uh, two fantastic uh, teachers who you will want to hear if you've not, not already heard. The first is Bob Proctor, the Dean of Prosperity and Abundance Teachings, shows people how to understand their hidden abilities to do more, be more, and have more in every area of life. His teachings are primarily based on Napoleon Hill's Think and grow rich, and his delivery is second to none. For more than 55 years, Bob Proctor has focused his entire agenda around helping people create lush lives of prosperity, rewarding relationships, and spiritual awareness. As one of the world's most highly regarded speakers on prosperity, he is internationally known for his inspirational and motivational style. He's been interviewed on CNN by Larry King and on the Ellen DeGeneres Show and will be on CNN Espanol later this month month. And the second, Dr. Michael Bart Bernard Beckwith, no stranger to my show since he is my big brother, is the founder and spiritual director of the Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles, which is celebrating its 30th year. Three of his most recent books, Life Visioning, Spiritual Liberation, and Transcendence Expanded are recipients of the prestigious Nautilus Award. Beckwith has appeared on Super Soul Sunday, just recently. Dr. Oz, Again, uh, the Oprah show, Larry King Live, Tavis Smiley, and his own PBS special, The Answer Is You. He's part of Oprah Winfrey's inaugural Super Soul 100. A sought-after speaker and meditation teacher, Michael's been the recipient of numerous humanitarian awards. Every Friday at 1 PST, thousands tune to his radio show on KPFK, Wake Up the sound of transformation. Please welcome two brilliant, fabulous men in my life, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith and Bob Proctor. <laughs> Good day to you, Marissa. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you, Marissa. Good to be here with you and Michael. Absolutely. And congratulations to you, Bob. One of the reasons I brought you on is because you are getting a fabulous tribute at Carnegie Hall in New York next month for your uh, many years of work. And I was just corrected. I thought you were 81, but you are 82. So you're a very good looking 82. You must use oil of Olay. 
<laughs> I don't hang around with old people, doctor. <laughs> well, it shows. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. <laughs> don't hang around with old people. Well, I love that saying, you know, you don't stop laughing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop laughing. So we do a lot of laughing here. So welcome to and uh, congratulations on your tribute. And both of us will be there in November. And we'll have a little more information about that later on in the show as well. We're giving away two tickets to that. PJ was kind enough to offer those to my listeners. So that will be part of the Asian Oprah giveaway later on the show. So you want to stay tuned so you can know how to win that. But first of all... I would like to, I know I usually don't talk about politics, but we're so close to the election. We're so close to uh, deciding, and and Bob, you're actually Canadian, but I did want a a couple of minutes to to just talk about, you know, we as uh, as, uh, people who are are trying to um, encourage people to be the best that they can be. We're in America. We're also about, you know, nonviolence. We're also about uh, raising the awareness and consciousness of uh, spirituality and new thought and ancient wisdom. What do you say to Americans right now who are either disgusted with both candidates, who are not knowing how to vote or wanting to to be good Americans, not understanding what's going on? What would you say to them? Well, first of all, I think America is the greatest country in the world. I am Canadian, but I love America. I think America has taught the world Uh, something about opportunity. It's the most generous country in the history of the world. And um, there's such great opportunity. You can focus on what's wrong with the election, or you can focus on the fact that they have an electoral system where anybody can run. And um, I think there's too much negativity in it. Mm -hmm. That's about all it is right now. But it's still, it's a, it's a free election. People can choose who they want. Mm-hmm. And I think America is a great country. Okay. I've always felt that. I've felt it for years. I remember one time many years ago, I got a green card. And I, um, I was driving across the border at Windsor, Detroit. My kids were all small. They were very small. Um, I think the oldest one was maybe seven. And then they run five to four, something like that. And we crossed the border. We had all the papers. And they gave me the green card. They took and laminated and gave it to me. And I was driving away from customs, driving into Michigan. And I had the most overwhelming feeling of gratitude. It was... um, it was very special. I can still remember it very clear in my mind. And I'm going way back to the late sixties. And I felt so fortunate that I could go anywhere in America. I could go from state to state. I could stay there for the rest of my life. If I wanted, I could work there. I could start a business there. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think of the millions of people that probably take it for granted. Mm -hmm. I was just given this card. I was an adult. I was married with children. And it was just an overwhelming feeling of freedom and and gratitude. And uh, I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I think of America, that's one thing that comes to my mind. Right. Michael? I think that uh, America stands for a tremendous amount of hope and possibility written within the the Constitution and all the uh, founding papers, there's possibility and vision. And it's up to the people who actually live in America uh, to actually make that vision come true. There's obviously a tremendous amount of work to be done in the justice system, the legal system, educational system, the medical system, uh, to come up to the highest vision of possible, that's that's possible. So it takes a tremendous amount, amount of work. Uh, I stand with Bob in terms of the awareness that there's tremendous opportunity and possibility here for people who can think outside of the box, can begin to see themselves with a greater identity, an identity of uh, the light, the identity of 
uh, a spiritual being that has no limits and no limitations. And, and so there's tremendous opportunity. So America is a place of, of tremendous hope. And as someone who lives, lives here and who has grown up in America, you know, I've always been one who was always on the edge of um, trying to make it better, trying mm -hmm. to transform it, trying to bring it into the ideal of, that it holds. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Dr. King who said that uh, he loved America so much that he, I'm paraphrasing, of course, that uh, his love of America allowed him uh, the, the possibility to criticize it more than others. Uh, because of where, where he stood and what he was experiencing at, at that particular time in his life. Mm -hmm. So in that same vein, I have tremendous critique, primarily around the fact that um, when we talk about the elections and uh, when we're talking about choosing two candidates, we have to be, there's a couple of levels. I know you don't want to get into a political talk here. But there's, there's <laughs> oh, well, I, I do and I kind of do and I kind of don't, but it's it's right. just, I, I watched, the, did you watch the debates last uh I, I, that that debate was nothing, yeah. but uh, I'll just interrupt <laughs> it because the same with the first one. There was nothing there. Nobody answered any questions. Right. But, uh, but I will say that you're dealing with paradigms, mm -hmm. and within the present paradigm, you choose a particular president that you believe can best serve all of America. However, there's another paradigm that's emerging that has nothing to do with those two candidates or the candidates of the third and fourth party. And that's the paradigm I think where Bob and I hang out about the possibility of a world that works for everyone, mm. where there's enough, enough energy, enough food. Now, all that stuff exists right now on the planet. There's an answer to every issue on the planet now in real time, mm -hmm. except where it's being suppressed by interests that are residing in the old paradigm. And so we have to be reminded that when you're dealing with the political scene, those individuals are in an old paradigm that's dying. We are in a paradigm that's emerging. And so if we can always separate that mm -hmm. in the old paradigm, choose the best candidate possible. But at the same time, work for the emerging paradigm mm -hmm. that speaks to more of a, a global awareness of everyone's needs being met. Thank you for I'll that. Stop. Thank you for that. No, no, no. It's important because I get asked that question, you know, where it's like, who who lost the debate? And the the answer is America. If you watched if you watched it, so then you're like, well, then do we vote? We don't vote. What do we do? So I love the answer. Yes, you do the best possible vote that you can in the old paradigm, and then look beyond that old construct, the old BS, the old belief system, and do what we can on the other end. So let's talk about the other end. Being the best that we can be, seeing prosperity not as money is the root of all evil, which is what I understand your message has been around uh, Bob for for 50 some years that it is okay to be prosperous rich abundant and that kind of flies against some of the the belief systems or the BS around spirituality or you know we shouldn't talk so much about money so so let's let's hit that one well, I think the problem with money is a problem, same with a lot of things. The real problem is ignorance. Uh, money is, uh, <laughs> is not a problem. The lack of it's a problem. With some people, too much of it's a problem. But money's merely an instrument, and it's only used for two things. One is to make you comfortable, and the more comfortable you are, the more creative you can become. And the second is to extend the good you do far beyond your own presence. Hmm. I have found that um, money will just make you more of what you already are. If you're not a nice person, you'll probably become despicable if you get enough of it. And if you are a nice person, you're going to become a nicer person because you're going to be able to do more good. So I see money as an instrument. And um, I think people don't understand money. Mm -hmm. Money is a reward received for service rendered. And it's an instrument that will enable you to extend the service you render far beyond your own presence. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm all for earning all the money you can, um, and then put it to work. Mm -hmm. I've been living in the same house for over 30 years. I have no desire to get a bigger, a better house. I like it here. I'm comfortable here. Um, I, um, I'm into, uh, supporting Cynthia Kersey and her endeavors of building schools in Africa. And we now build a school every week and a half. 
I want to get to the point we can build one every day. Mm -hmm. And without money, we wouldn't be able to do that. So I see money as a great instrument, and that's all it is. It enables you to extend the good you do beyond your own presence. It doesn't make you a better person. It makes you more of what you already are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Michael? Reverend Mike? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, Bob and I have been in this conversation for years, and Bob, uh, it's articulation of the prosperity principles are second to none on the planet. And I would agree with him that money is a, a promissory note, is a, is a promise that energy is going to be circulated. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's an exchange of money, you're exchanging energy, you're saying in substance, uh, if, I, if I go buy a loaf of bread, that means I'm, I'm, I'm giving energy to the individual that's selling me the bread, that he can take that energy and send his kids to school, they can go on to college. I mean, money is to be circulated, mm -hmm. and and we have to stop and, and and understand that there's no lack of prosperity or abundance or uh, opulence anywhere in the universe. That's that's a that's a myth. It's a lie. It's a lie of scarcity. And so, when one begins to understand that they're standing in the middle of a sea of abundance and infinite opportunities, infinite possibilities, and begin to think creatively then money follows or energy follows, opportunity follows. Mm -hmm. So money isn't the root of all evil. When years ago, when uh, religious folks began to take vows of poverty, it wasn't about uh, being poor. It was about not allowing money to be your God so that service would be your God. I mean, Mother, Mother Teresa, as an example, uh, took a vow of poverty, but he raised, she raised millions of dollars mm -hmm. to do the work she needed to do to feed the poor and to, to, to feed those and to take care of those who were sick mm -hmm. and impoverished. She needed money to do so. Mm -hmm. So though money wasn't her God in terms of, as Bob was saying, buy her bigger, buy her bigger, bigger mansions and 20 cars and, 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 and being materialistic, she still had the consciousness of raising a lot of money to do the work she needed to do. Yeah. I'm the founder of Agape International. I have many ministries, many programs, many projects. I have global philanthropy. I do work with Cynthia Kersey, who emerged out of Agape. And uh, uh, we, we, we raise money. We attract money. We uh, uh, bring money into Agape so that we can extend the work that we do for mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. I like Bob. I've lived in the same house for many, for many years. And uh, I'm not materialistic. I have a car that's paid for. Uh, I haven't. I don't. I haven't bought a new car every year. The car's ten years old. It runs pretty good. Mm -hmm. when it Tes work the well, Tesla's enough. coming. Tesla's coming. The Tesla's coming. <laughs> okay. If somebody wants to donate a Tesla to me. I will receive it. I have no problem in being receptive to my good. But uh, there's nothing wrong inherently with money. Right. It's uh, materialism. Consumerism can become evil. And individuals who are greedy and stingy, who hoard money, who don't let it circulate into good works, that can become evil. Mm -hmm. There are individuals that I know that are very, very unhappy people, and very wealthy, mm -hmm. according to human standards, but very unhappy. They're mm -hmm. afraid to circulate one nickel towards anyone that will help anyone, and they're very unhappy people. So as Bob was saying, if you're, if you're on the curve of becoming a better person, you're growing, developing, and unfolding, money's going to assist that, and it's going to assist you in helping mm -hmm. others. And if you're on the curb, curve of uh, not knowing yourself, being ignorant of your real identity, and, you, and you're, you're in a consciousness of lack, even if you get a lot of money, you'll be a poor person with a lot of money, mm -hmm. and you'll end up uh, uh, despising your life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have no problems with money. Uh, bring it on. I'm receptive. <laughs> right, right. You know, right. we had a, um, I was having a conversation one day with Mikey Steller, who in our company, marketing director of our company, and a couple come up in conversation, and she said, you know, they're the poorest people I know. All they have is money. All <laughs> they have is money. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I, the I problem with money is we don't teach people how to earn money. You can go all the way through our educational system and learn absolutely nothing about earning money. Okay. It's, um, we're taught how to save it. We're taught how to invest it, but we're not taught how to earn it. And so you have um, brilliant people going around and they don't know how to earn money. Um, yeah. Money is a reward for service rendered. The amount of money you earn is always in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there is in replacing you. Mm -hmm. But you take nothing with you. When you leave, you leave much the same way you come. I, I always say you leave with 
no hair, no teeth, no money. That's how you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go a step further, Bob. I, I, I would even say within our school system, they don't even teach you how to save and invest money or how to open a bank account or in, any of that. People graduate from high school and know nothing about the law of circulation. They know mm-hmm. nothing about the law of receptivity. They know nothing about the law of correspondence. They know nothing about the law of saving and investing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get it they, if they go to college. Oftentimes, they know nothing after they graduate from college. It's not a part of our our educational system. Mm-hmm. And it's you know, all we, you know. There's so many people operate with limited supply. I love the way Troward put it in his uh, essay on spirit of opulence. He says, when you're dealing with infinite, you can never take more than your share. There's, right. There's uh-huh, one that's for beautiful. everyone. Right. Of it's inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. Yeah. Yeah. But then why are there so many people, and maybe this is a perception, but I meet so many spiritually minded people who are broke or they they continue to affirm their brokenness or I can't afford that or I can't do that or or I don't have they enough don't money this month. understand what they're saying generally. Mm-hmm. And then you have you the know, other we- end, people like Donald Trump, who has a, the appearance of so much money and and you that that whole perception around corporate greed and you know the 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 nasty people or the mean people have all the money have all the wealth there that disparity of the have and the have nots or good people who who deserve to have or work hard and then they get their pensions all taken away or you know what what is that what is all of that stuff well, you know, you threw a lot of things into one question, Marissa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, Thank you. Gen- Thank you. Gen- generally speaking, whether you're spiritual or, or whatever, so many people do not understand the laws of the universe. Mm-hmm. They don't understand their conversation. They don't understand the power of their word. They don't understand the power of their thinking. So though they may love God and whatever concept of God that they have, they have very little understanding about the magnitude of the abundance that surrounds us and how and and, and they've made an agreement with mediocrity that uh, money uh, is uh, a lot of money uh, is uh, makes you evil and nasty so they have to break that particular agreement with that mediocre thinking understand the laws of the universe and begin to manifest uh, the the money that they need in order to do the will of God in order to do a greater expression of life everyone doesn't need to be a multi 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 millionaire Everybody has a different vision, different gift, different talents, different capacities for service, but they can demonstrate what it is that they need to be their authentic self. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you're talking about individuals that you've just mentioned, you know, the new... the media always gravitates towards the lowest common denominator of the human experience and the grossest uh, experience that we can find. So naturally, we would be saddled with all of these individuals who are nasty and mean and have a lot of money because uh, it, it, it brings people to the television sets. Mm. But there are many people who are very philanthropic, many people who have millions of dollars who live to give. Who, uh, who, who, who generate a lot of money, support spiritual communities, support school systems, support all manner of efforts. But you don't really hear about these people because many times they're not run by their ego. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're, they're doing good work. But you would hear about individuals who are in politics because you have to have a big ego to even be at that level of running to run a country, you see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. That thank you. That actually answered all of mine, <laughs> all of my multi- myriad of questions. And if you've just tuned in and you're wondering who the two fabulous men on my camera are and in my, in my studio today, it is Bob Proctor, and uh, he is a master coach. He's a prosperity teacher. He's been doing this forever. And uh, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, founder of Agape International Spiritual Center, also known as my big brother. And they are here sharing their wisdom to add to my wisdom series. You'll remember the show with Neil Donald Walsh and with Don Miguel Ruiz. And we're talking about money. We're talking a little bit about politics. And now I'm going to highlight you, Bob, just for a second and talk about who, who would you say your two most important influential mentors were in getting you to where you are today. And Michael, that will come to, the, to you as well in the next question. Well, actually, there's more than two. There's, there's three or four. Okay. Um, Ray Stanford 
is um, the first one. He, um, he is a man that I came across in 1961. And he gave me this book. The book has fallen apart now. But I've been reading this book every day now for in another 10 days, it'll be 55 years. Mm. From October the 21st, 1961, Think and Grow Rich. And then I got into, uh, you know, just packing this up to take with me on the road. This is a recording that Earl Knight gave me. That's a record. Hmm. On one <laughs> side, it says strangest secret. On the other side, it says to pay the price. And I started to listen to this record. I should show you this because this is a bit of an antique as well. See, aren't you glad I made you do Skype so we had show and tell? (laughs) Yeah, here. And I'm glad kids know what vinyl is now, too. Can you see this? (laughs) Oh, wow. Is that the portable player? Portable record player. Wow, that's so cool. Not long ago, Albert Schweitzer, the great doctor and Nobel Prize winner, was being interviewed in London, and a reporter asked him, Doctor, what's wrong with men today? The great doctor was silent a moment, and then he said, Men simply don't think. And that is a problem. <laughs> and, I, but I got into um, Think and Grow Rich, and then I got Earl Nightingale's condensed narration of Think and Grow Rich, which led me to that recording, The Strangest Secret. So those two men had a phenomenal impact on my life. Mm-hmm. And my life changed like night and day, and I couldn't figure out what I had done. Hmm. I had been, I was living in England. I started cleaning offices to earn some extra money. And within a year of reading this and sitting down with Ray, my income had gone from 4000 to 175000 I remember when he gave me this book, he said, if you'll do exactly what I tell you, you can have anything you seriously want. Well, I didn't believe that. I was broke. I was unhappy. I No formal education. Uh, and I just didn't believe it. But I believed he believed it. Hmm. And I think that did something to me. And so I started to do exactly what he said. I was living in England. I had open offices in about seven different cities in Canada and the United States. And I was living over in England, and I had earned over a million dollars, and I couldn't figure out what happened. <laughs> I um, I didn't think I was lucky. I didn't believe in luck. I um, I had been raised to believe if you're going to do really well, you've got to be really smart. I knew I wasn't that smart. I had also been raised to believe if you don't go to school, you'll never get a good job. I didn't have a good job. I owned the company. And um, I had only gone to school for two months, high school. And so I wanted to know what happened, and I started to study. I ended up going to work with Earl Nightingale and Lloyd Conan, and I met Leland Val Vandewell and Dr. Harry Roder. So there's four or five of them that really shaped me. And it took me nine and a half years, but when I got the dots to connect, all I wanted to do was teach it. Mm-hmm. And did, did they I criticize think we're you? I led down the wrong path. Mm. I think we have to understand the essence of who we are. And that's what these people started to teach me. Okay. We are spiritual beings. We are a soul. We don't have one. And the soul is forever seeking its awareness of its oneness with God. So we're always attempting to expand our level of awareness. And I've never stopped studying, and I never will stop studying. I absolutely love to study this. I love to study who we are. And all I want to do is share it. That's, that's, that is my great motivation. When I wake up in the morning, that's what I want to do. And that's all I want to do. Mm. I don't want to do anything else. So I've had four or five people that really had a profound impact on my life. And they helped me begin to understand who I am. But I think it's a process. I don't think you ever get it all put together. Mm-hmm. I think it's a, it's a process. You be, keep becoming more and more aware. And the more aware you become, I think, the more effective you are, mm-hmm. the better you're able to share it. How much of that was them believing in you, even though you didn't believe in yourself? Oh, I think it was 
That was an enormous part of it. Okay. You see, I think what they do is they lead you to start to believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, everything you study, I don't care, you can get into Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Torah, the Bible, all the psychological books, all Hills and Carnegie's, and every place they tell you, you have to believe. Mm -hmm. And that was really playing on my mind because I was thinking, how do you believe? You know, right. somebody said, just believe it. Well, how do you believe? Yeah. And I was having lunch with one of my mentors, Leland Bell Van de Waal. He was a brilliant man. And he's gone now, God bless him, but he sure helped me. And he said something and like everything fell into place. He said, our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about it will change. Mm -hmm. Well, most of our beliefs we inherited, we didn't originate them ourselves at all. Most of the beliefs that people have are absolutely absurd. Uh, That's they, why they're they, called they BS. Have no foundation whatsoever. And when he said that, I got him to repeat it because it was like bells going off in my head. I suddenly found out how and why I changed. I had changed my belief system about who I was mm. and what I was capable of doing. And I did that through reevaluating who I was. All this material I was studying, I was trying to figure out me. I was trying to figure out who I was. Mm. And as I started to reevaluate my belief about myself, my relationship with God or infinite, and uh, my relationship with you, with Michael, with the world in general, shifted completely. And I could see we're all one. There's only one power. And we're all an expression of that power. Everything's an expression of that power. But yeah. we're a special expression because we're created in God's image. We've got creative faculties. We're creative beings. Mm -hmm. So we can do something that no other form of life can do. Yeah. All the other forms of life um, uh, have everything we've got except our creative faculties. Mm. Yep. We... Well, all the other forms of life are completely at home in their environment. They blend in. We're, we're totally disoriented in our environment. And that is because we've been blessed with the faculties to create our own environment. And unfortunately, too many have not learned that. And they're a product of their environment rather yeah. than create their own environment. Thank you for that, Bob. We're going to have to have him uh, at the pulpit on Sunday. <laughs> right, Barbara Michael? That yeah, was you wanna, awesome. You want to come in, Bob? You come in and, <laughs> that was great. You come in this month. You come in this month, Bob. <laughs> Absolutely. I would love to Michael anytime. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to call you when we hang up. And I, know, you <laughs> I know, right. And we're going to have to you know, take a quick if, little break if I right now. Drop for a second. Michael had me speak at his church one time, and it was the first time I'd been there. Uh -huh. And I said that everybody should go there at least once. <laughs> it was it was a spiritual experience, the like of which I uh, I had never had. Mm. It was something very special. And when I got up to the front, he had everybody stand up and put their hands out and send love to me. Uh, it changed right. my whole being. Oh. That is, I think, the agape is without question one of the most phenomenal centers of spirituality on the on the planet. Oh, it, that's it's beautiful. certainly the most powerful one I've ever been in. Oh, thank you, Bob. That's my home, and and that's oh, well, and that's my no, teacher, and and uh, that's not just my thoughts. I think that's the thoughts of a lot of people. That's beautiful, and uh, you, and we will come back with a little more of that love. And <laughs> but we do have to take a quick promotional break to thank those who help sponsor this show. So we'll be back in two and two. Peace in, and peace out. Remember the movie The Secret. Will come to Carnegie Hall, New York, and celebrate the Lifetime Achievement Tribute for Bob Proctor, the father of personal development, November 14th and 15th. Join Dr. Marissa, the Asian Oprah, and the who's who of personal development, including other secret teachers, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, Laura Langemeyer, and more for an event to remember. For tickets, go to www.moderndaymillionaire.com. That's moderndaymillionaire.com. And we are back. 
You are tuned in to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Tuesday at Naturally High Noon out of the Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood, California, Universal Broadcasting Network, and every Thursday and Saturday on my CNBC News Radio channel, uh, KCAA AM 1050 FM 106.5, and all over the place with iHeartRadio now. And today we are continuing with our wisdom series with two brilliant men, Bob Proctor, the Dean of Prosperity and Self-Growth, and as well, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, founder and spiritual director of Agape International Spiritual Center. And Bob, before you were mentioning people and how they helped you and the most influential people and that they believed in you even when you didn't believe them in yourself the same way. And I have to say that is exactly my story. And I just wanted to give a little love right now to um, Reverend Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, who really did do that for me. So almost eight years ago, I was a person who did not. I had a belief system about myself that was... You know, on the outside looked pretty good, but on the inside just did not. Um, I, 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 you know, I thought I was a piece of shiitake. Uh, no matter how, how hot shiitake I looked or uh, acted, I felt that way. And it was because of his teaching and his belief in me that I could change how I saw myself. And now, look at me now. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. I love you so much. Thank you very much. So you're always good about that for me. So I wanted to, to make sure I did that on the air. So anyways, okay, enough love. Uh, next, <laughs> uh, Reverend Michael, who, who yes. would you say are the two people who really influenced you to be who you are? Uh, well, like, like uh, Bob, it's way more than two. But as an, as an adult, uh, I had a spiritual awakening in my early 20s that um, allowed me to go on a path to discover what had happened to me. And so uh, naturally, I had to, I, I bumped into the teachings of Jesus the Christ again and understood them from a much more higher metaphysical, mystical awareness and not merely from a re from religiosity uh, uh, awareness. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was another individual that uh, the law of compensation and other essays really hit me. I also picked up uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, uh, Dr. Daniel M. Morgan, who was the founder of the Agidist Church of Religious Science, a great uh, articulate word master of metaphysics, helped uh, me put language to the experience I was having within. Dr. Homer Johnson, a great uh, metaphysical mystic that I would sit with on Saturdays, uh, many Saturdays, riding my bicycle over to his house, uh, helped me understand the inner uh, dynamic of my oneness with God that I was feeling so intensely. Dr. Thomas Troward, I mean, yeah, Dr. Thomas Troward, I studied his work, studied Ernest Holmes. Uh, I studied uh, Thomas, Thomas Hora, who was a great psychiatrist who created meta-psychiatry. Mm. He was a great teacher of mine back in the early 80s. Um, there's been so many. Dr. Howard Thurman mm. uh, really was able to language uh, the deep human ex angst of the human experience, but at the same time, the understanding of our mystical connection to a presence that's never, ever absent, absent and is inexhaustible. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so many uh, teachers on this side of the veil and the other uh, influenced me to really have, as Bob was saying, just to have a deep practice. I think uh, as you transcend belief systems, into uh, what, what are we really practicing? Mm -hmm. Bob was saying, and he wakes up and he studies every day. Right. You know, he's been at yeah. this over 50 something years, and every day he's still a student. That's where I live, Marissa. Mm -hmm. I'm, my mind, I have a beginner's mind. I'm a student of the teachings. I, I, I meditate every day. Mm -hmm. I pray every day. I study every day. Mm -hmm. I ask to be of service every day. And I have the same fire in me today that I had over 40 years ago when I had my initial opening as an adult. There's been no waning of that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm just beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm just beginning. I can uh, read something, uh, a paragraph, 20, 40, 50 times in the same book. Mm -hmm. And every time I read it, the, the lines may not have changed in the book, but I have. I've right. had a deeper understanding of myself, life, and uh, I, I see... What's written in between the lines, mm -hmm. and so uh, 
So Thurman, Dr. Dan Morgan, Homer Johnson, Ralph Holder Emerson, Napoleon Hill, uh, these individuals, uh, Walter Russell, another great teacher of mine, uh, was the greatest mystic that ever came out of America. Mm. Many people don't even know about him, right. but but he, um, uh, you know, he recorded uh, the, the the many of the um, elements in the chart before individuals could see it. He was a, a multimillionaire. He was a uh, ice skating champion at sixty nine years old. He invented wow. the duplex. Uh, <laughs> uh, so across the across the, the, the he was a deeply spiritual man. But like we were talking about earlier, he had no problem with money. He was a deeply spiritual man. He went into cosmic consciousness at the same time. To, uh, 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 was a multimillionaire, a great, uh, wonderful mansion in Virginia, great teacher. He was one of my uh, early influencers because when I would go into these uh, bouts of being in the light uh, for periods of time, I didn't know what that was until I studied Walter Russell and studied some of the great mystics. I understood I was being taught mm -hmm. in the light from these cosmic awarenesses. So Walter Russell uh, influenced my life tremendously. Right. And everyone should know who Walter Russell is, if you're an American at least. There's a wonderful book called The Man Who Tapped the Secrets of the Universe by Glenn Clark. And he writes about Walter Russell. And the other book he wrote was about George Washington Carver, The Man Who Talked to Flowers. That was another great influencer mm -hmm. because most people thought that, uh, think that uh, George Washington Carver was a scientist. He was a mystic. Mm. He woke up at four o'clock every single day, talked to the flowers. They would tell him what they were useful for. Then he would go into his laboratory and prove what the flowers had told him. Wow. So most people think that, that he was trial and error going into a laboratory and discovering things. And he wasn't doing anything by trial and error. Mm -hmm. He was having a direct encounter with the spirit via the flowers and the trees and the ground. And then he would grow into, go into the laboratory and prove it. Most people don't understand that. Right. I have a picture of George Washington Carver in my office, an actual photograph. Wow. because I was teaching about him one year and uh, this gentleman who was into demolition brought back these pictures of him and he said they had been thrown away in the trash can at a Hollywood studio because no one knew who this black man was. Oh, wow. But because wow. he had taken my class, he knew it was George Washington Carver. Wow. So I had these actual photographs of George Washington Carver in my office as a reminder to wake up every single morning and to commune with the mm -hmm. presence and to commune with nature. And we, and he, one thing he said, he said, if you fall in, fall in love with something deep enough, it will reveal its secrets to you. Mm -hmm. So I fall in love every single day with the presence. That's I beautiful. fall in love every single day with the infinite and it reveals its secrets to me. Mm -hmm. And and I think that answers the common, uh, the question that, that uh, has a common answer between the two views. Well, the secret to success is that thirst for knowledge. That secret to success is not sitting around waiting for something to fall in your lap or think that I deserve to have something or that something is entitled to me and I've worked so hard, why am I not? But that w just for the sake of wanting to learn, the sake, f the sake of wanting to grow and expand and be so... Um, in love with life. And that seems to be a dis-ease in life that ha I see more and more in my life co balance coaching sessions where people are just, you know, they don't want to live or they see no reason to live. And I ask them, how much do you read? How much, you know, do, do you, is there anything that interests you? Is there anything, you know, when was the last time you took a walk? And it's like this this well it's i don't i don't feel like doing it and and it seems like this i don't know that's a disease not, it, it is a disease that's a disease right. emotional reasoning is a disease yeah. whenever someone says i don't feel like it that is now classified psychologically as a disease you do not not do something because you don't feel like it that that's uh, that's a, a train wreck starting <laughs> to happen when mm -hmm. you start to become inspired uh, and motivated, and you start to uh, yield to your greatness, you do things you don't feel like doing. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like getting up, you get up anyway. Right. You don't feel like eating the right food, you do it anyway. Right. You don't feel like studying a little bit, you do it anyway. And that's So I, I don't feel like it is a disease that many people have. It's called yes. laziness. And, what, and many people are afraid 
to, to, to break free from the herd because they don't want to be talked about. You know, because when you start to break free, people don't like you. They talk about you. <laughs> Who do they think he is? But you know what? They never gossip about a couch potato. They only gossip <laughs> about people who are trying to make a difference. Yeah. You know, Michael, you just said something. Uh, you were saying you read the same thing over and over. This is a book holder that I have on my desk. And I'll keep this open. This is The Hidden Power by Thomas Troward. And right now, I'm reading Affirmative Power. And it's only three pages, but I've been reading it for three months. Right. Every day. Let me read you the start. It's so good. Thoroughly to realize the true nature of affirmative power is to possess the key to the great secret. Yeah. Troward is such a phenomenal author. My goodness. My I mean, <laughs> he takes the most complicated and he windows it down so I can understand it. But I have this, I have a, it's a book holder. When I went into Earl Nightingale's office way back around 1965, I noticed he had a holder to hold the book open on his desk. And that stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I asked him why he had it. He said, because I read the same page over and over again for a couple of months. I've yeah. been doing it ever since then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The same thing. I, I love Thomas Troward. I have a, a powerful statement that I love of his. He says, in order to uh, 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 understand the wonders of the universe, you have to do two things. You have to realize you're at the center of it. At the same time, you have to withdraw all thinking that you can contribute anything to its efficiency. <laughs> ah. So you're at the you know, center of the universe and you can't control any of its efficiency. It, well, you, you know, know you're he, not all he, that. Uh, <laughs> in the Dory lectures, he said something that's very interesting and a person could easily miss. He said, my mind is a center of divine operation. That's right. Now, in everything, if I was holding a basketball, there's only one center. There's only one center in this studio that I'm in. There's only one center in a city. If I had an apple, there's only one center. He said, my mind is a center. That would indicate there's more than one center. Right. And I stumbled on that and I thought, wow, that's huge. You're dealing with infinite, any point center. Mm. Every point is center. That's right. Yeah. We're at the center of the universe, and we are centers. I think some people got it mixed up. They thought they, they, it was a mistype. They heard center, <laughs> but it was center. We're not, <laughs> we're not original centers. We're original centers in the mind of God. <laughs> uh, that's right. That, that's great. Well, in anything, you know. Don't get me and Bob started up by the outer I, I know. When there is no outer measurements, I have here a globe. <laughs> There's only great. one center, and that's determined by the outer measurements. Mm. But when you're dealing with infinite, there is no outer measurement. So every point is center. Yeah. Every point is center. Yeah. And if you're not following, I just want you to just don't worry about following. Just watch the transformation of these two young men <laughs> on camera when they're talking about something that they're excited about. You guys look like you're like eight years old and you're all excited about what you're talking about. It's beautiful, doesn't it? I mean, they look ageless when, the, and this is, and this is the, the fountain of youth right here. Be interested, be enthusiastic, love what you're doing, want to think. You know, there's nothing worse than contempt before investigation. Just go out and learn and grow and, and think and be rich and and use the, the money that you have to do everything that you want and more. And that, I think, is the bottom line here. <laughs> you know, I have, I have traveled all over the world now for well over 50 years. And I have found everywhere I go, I keep asking people, what do you want? What do you really want? Mm -hmm. And I've come to the conclusion, people just want three basic things. Oddly enough, most people don't want to be really wealthy. What they do want, they don't want to have any financial concerns. They want to be free in so far as money's concerned. If they want to take a trip, they want to be able to take it. Mm -hmm. if they want to buy a dress or a suit, they want to be able to buy it. No financial concerns. Number two, they want to wake up and really be excited about how they're going to spend their day. Mm -hmm. They're going to do what they love all day. And they want to mix with people who are creative and productive and creatively productive. They're upbeat. 
And they're about what the three things want. I've got those three things. Mm -hmm. I love my life. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is just keep growing. Greater awareness. Beautiful. That's, that's And that's the final word. <laughs> Nothing more needed. I have that life too. And I'm so grateful for it. And I know that you do too, Reverend Michael. Is there any oh. last word from you for the listeners out there? Thank you, Bob. That was perfect. I, I would, uh, I think everything that we said has covered a lot of material. I would say that we, all of us are at the center of the universe. As he quoted uh, Troward, our mind is, at, is a center in the mind of infinite possibilities. We have to know the difference between thinking and mentation. Mentation is the regurgitation of thoughts and opinions and points of view that you have every day. As Bob mentioned earlier, some of them you've inherited, some of them you get from the collective race consciousness, from the overculture, from the news. We have to have inspira inspired thought. Mm. Inspiration is a different kind of thought than your normal mentating. Inspiration comes directly from the mind of the universe. Yes. So you have to court it. It has to be important to you. You have to wake up and want that. You have to study, you have to meditate, you have to vision so that you can be inspired. Inspiration pulls you mm. to a greater expression of your real destiny. And I will say one other thing, Every single being, it's not a throwback in the bunch. Every being has a great destiny within them. That's right. They have to discover it, uncover it, activate it, and ultimately express it. There's not a throwback in the bunch. The universe did not create any accidents, any extra people. Everyone matters. Everyone is a unique expression of infinite possibility. And we have to wake up to that absolute right. truth. And so it is. Thank you so much, Bob Proctor. Michael Bernard you, Beckwith Dr. for an amazing show, for uh, amazing words of wisdom. They're talking to you, you who doesn't believe that they are good enough or worthy enough. You are wrapped in a warm blanket of worthiness. You are loving, loved, and lovable, and don't you forget it. This is Dr. Marissa signing out for now. I'll be right back with The Balance Bar. Thank you so much to both. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. It's always good being with you, Bob. My pleasure, Michael. We'll Thank see you, you in New York. I'm going to call you about a date to speak at Agape. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Love Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank and you. the Asian Oprah giveaway is uh, part of our balance bar. At the end of the show where I invite you to come with me for more balance. And the Asian Oprah giveaway today is two premier tickets to uh, Bob Proctor's tribute at Carnegie Hall. And that is November 14th and 15th. And they were kind enough to gift me two premier tickets worth over $500. So the first two to uh, contact me at forbalance.org on my website and say, I want to go to New York. You will receive those free tickets. As well, uh, the 21 Day Fast from Complaining with Dr. Marissa, part of the Balance Bar. My tip for day 18 is when I wake up, my ego wants me to board the train that is afraid of what bad things might happen, who has done me wrong, who might be doing me wrong, and what I haven't done perfectly, and then I want to complain. I can choose to move my ego into the passenger seat or just get off that train altogether and board the one on the other side of the train. My freedom train gently guides my mind to focus on the things that are good, beautiful, working in my life, that all my needs are met, that I have a roof over my head, food on the table, love in my life. And no matter what CNN, constantly negative news and the old say, the universe wants me to be happy, joyous and free. If you haven't already officially joined the fast, please do so at www.drmarissa.tv and make sure that new app that houses every tip and challenges not to complain with bells and whistles done by my teenagers in my life called No Complaints. Make sure you get that at the App Store. Join me this weekend as the Catalina Jazz Tracks Festival with my guest last month, Keiko Matsui, Billboard Charts uh, jazz keyboardist and humanitarian will be performing there and for today an additional Asian Oprah giveaway two tickets to Acoustic Alchemy show that's at Catalina Island Jazz Tracks Festival Saturday October 22nd the first one to comment on my Facebook page with I Love Acoustic Alchemy will win and next week it is the last week of the month so get ready for another scintillating sexual healing with Dr. Marissa because I'm determined to make pleasure a G-rated topic so keep yourself tuned in to take my advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. Pay. That's P for positive. Peace in and peace out.
it was um, it was very special. I can still remember it very clear in my mind, and I'm going way back to the late 60s. And I felt so fortunate that I could go anywhere in America. I could go from state to state. I could stay there for the rest of my life if I wanted. I could work there. I could start a business there. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think of the millions of people that probably take it for granted. Mm -hmm. See, I was just given this card. I was an adult. I was married with children. And it was just an overwhelming feeling of freedom and, and gratitude. And uh, I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I think of America, that, that's one thing that comes to my mind. Right. Michael? I think that uh, America stands for a tremendous amount of hope and possibility written within the, the Constitution and all the uh, founding papers, this possibility and vision. And it's up to the people who actually live in America uh, to actually make that vision come true. There's a, a obviously a tremendous amount of work to be done in the justice system, the legal system, educational system, the medical system uh, to come up to the highest vision of possible, that, that's possible. So it's, it takes a tremendous amount, amount of work. Uh, I stand with Bob in terms of the awareness that there's tremendous opportunity and possibility here for people who can think outside of the box, can begin to see themselves with a greater identity, an identity of uh, the light, the identity of uh, a spiritual being that has no limits and no limitations. And, and so there's tremendous opportunity. So America is a place of, of tremendous hope. And as someone who lives, lives here and who has grown up in America, you know, I've always been one who was always on the edge of um, trying to make it better, trying mm -hmm. to transform it, trying to bring it into the ideal of, that it holds. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Dr. King who said that uh, he loved America so much that he, I'm paraphrasing, of course, that uh, his love of America allowed him uh, the, the possibility to criticize it more than others. Uh, because of where, where he stood and what he was experiencing at, at that particular time in his life. Mm -hmm. So in that same vein, I have tremendous critique, primarily around the fact that um, when we talk about the elections and uh, when we're talking about choosing two candidates, we have to be, there's a couple of levels. I know you don't want to get into a political talk here. But there's, there's <laughs> oh, well, I, I do and I kind of do and I kind of don't, but it's it's right. just, I, I watched, the, did you watch the debates last uh I, I, that that debate was nothing, yeah. but uh, I, I just interrupt <laughs> because the same with the first one. There was nothing there. Nobody answered any questions. Right. But uh, but I will say that you're dealing with paradigms, mm -hmm. and within the present paradigm, you choose a particular president that you believe can best serve all of America. However, there's another paradigm that's emerging that has nothing to do with those two candidates or the candidates of the third and fourth party. And that's the paradigm I think where Bob and I hang out about the possibility of a world that works for everyone, mm. where there's enough, enough energy, enough food. Now, all that stuff exists right now on the planet. There's an answer to every issue on the planet now in real time, mm -hmm. except where it's being suppressed by interests that are residing in the old paradigm. And so we have to be reminded that when you're dealing with the political scene, those individuals are in an old paradigm that's dying. We are in a paradigm that's emerging. And so if we can always separate that mm -hmm. in the old paradigm, choose the best candidate possible. But at the same time, work for the emerging paradigm mm -hmm. that speaks to more of a, a global awareness of everyone's needs being met. Thank you for I'll that. Stop. Thank you for that. No, no, no. It's important because I get asked that question, you know, where it's like, who who lost the debate? And the the answer is America. If you watched if you watched it. So then you're like, well, then do we vote? We don't vote. What do we do? So I love the answer. Yes, you do the best possible vote that you can in the old paradigm and then look beyond that old construct, the old BS, the old belief system and do what we can on the other end. So let's talk about the other end, being the best that we can be, seeing prosperity, not as money is the root of all evil, which is what I understand your message has been around uh, Bob for for 50 some years that it is okay to be prosperous rich abundant 
And that kind of flies against some of the the belief systems or the BS around spirituality or, you know, we shouldn't talk so much about money. So so let's let's hit that one. Well, I think the problem with money is the problem, the same with a lot of things. The real problem is ignorance. Uh, money is, uh, <laughs> is not a problem. The lack of it's a problem. With some people, too much of it's a problem. But money's merely an instrument, and it's only used for two things. One is to make you comfortable, and the more comfortable you are, the more creative you can become. And the second is to extend the good you do far beyond your own presence. Hmm. I have found that um, money will just make you more of what you already are. If you're not a nice person, you'll probably become despicable if you get enough of it. And if you are a nice person, you're going to become a nicer person because you're going to be able to do more good. So I see money as an instrument. And um, I think people don't understand money. Mm -hmm. Money is reward received for service rendered. And it's an instrument that will enable you to extend the service you render far beyond your own presence. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm all for earning all the money you can, um, and then put it to work. Mm -hmm. I've been living in the same house for over 30 years. I have no desire to get a bigger, a better house. I like it here. I'm comfortable here. Um, I, um, I'm into, um, supporting Cynthia Kersey and her endeavors of building schools in Africa. And we now build a school every week and a half. I want to get to the point we can build one every day. Mm -hmm. And without money, we wouldn't be able to do that. So I see money as a great instrument, and that's all it is. It enables you to extend the good you do beyond your own presence. It doesn't make you a better person. It makes you more of what you already are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Michael? Reverend Michael? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, Bob and I have been in this conversation for years, and Bob, uh, it's articulation of the prosperity principles are second to none on the planet. And I would agree with him that money is a, a promissory note, is a, is a promise that energy is going to be circulated. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's an exchange of money, you're exchanging energy, you're saying in substance, uh, if, I, if I go buy a loaf of bread, that means I'm, I'm, I'm giving energy to the individual that's selling me the bread, that he can take that energy and send his kids to school. They can go on to college. I mean, money is to be circulated, mm -hmm. and and we have to stop and, and and understand that there's no lack of prosperity or abundance or uh, opulence anywhere in the universe. That's that's a that's a myth. It's a lie. It's a lie of scarcity, and so when one begins to understand that they're standing in the middle of a sea of abundance and infinite opportunities, and infinite possibilities, and begin to think creatively then money follows or energy follows, opportunity follows. Mm -hmm. So money isn't the root of all evil. When years ago, when uh, religious folks began to take vows of poverty, it wasn't about uh, being poor. It was about not allowing money to be your God so that service would be your God. I mean, Mother, Mother Teresa, as an example, uh, took a vow of poverty, but he raised, she raised millions of dollars mm -hmm. to do the work she needed to do to feed the poor and to, to, to feed those and to take care of those who were sick mm -hmm. and impoverished. She needed money to do so. Mm -hmm. So though money wasn't her God in terms of, as Bob was saying, buy her bigger, buy her bigger, bigger mansions and 20 cars and, 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 and being materialistic, she still had the consciousness of raising a lot of money to do the work she needed to do. Yeah. I'm the founder of Agape International. I have many ministries, many programs, many projects. I have global philanthropy. I do work with Cynthia Kersey, who emerged out of Agape. And uh, uh, we, we, we raise money. We attract money. We uh, uh, bring money into Agape so that we can extend the work that we do for mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. I like Bob. I've lived in the same house for many, for many years. And uh, I'm not materialistic. I have a car that's paid for. Uh, I haven't. I don't. I haven't bought a new car every year. The car's ten years old. It runs pretty good. Mm -hmm. when it Tes work, the Tesla's well, enough, coming. Tesla's coming. The Tesla's <laughs> coming. Okay. Somebody wants to donate a Tesla to me. I will receive it. I have no problem in being receptive to my good. But uh, there's nothing wrong inherently with money. Right. It's uh, materialism. Mm -hmm. Consumerism can become evil. And individuals who are greedy and stingy, who hoard money, who don't let it circulate into good works, that can become evil. Mm -hmm. There are individuals that I know that are very, very unhappy people, and very wealthy, mm -hmm. according to human standards, but very unhappy. They're afraid to circulate one nickel 
towards anyone that will help anyone, and they're very unhappy people. So as Bob was saying, if you're, if you're on the curve of becoming a better person, you're growing, developing, and unfolding, money's going to assist that, and it's going to assist you in helping mm-hmm. others. And if you're on the curb, curve of uh, not knowing yourself, being ignorant of your real identity, and, you, and you're, you're in a consciousness of lack, even if you get a lot of money, you'll be a poor person with a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And you'll end up uh, uh, despising your life. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I have no problems with money. Uh, bring it on. I'm receptive. Right, right. <laughs> you know, right. we had a, um, I was having a conversation one day with Mikey Steller, who in our company, marketing director of our company. And a couple come up in conversation. And she said, you know, they're the poorest people I know. All they have is money. All they have is money. Yeah, it is. The problem with money is we don't teach people how to earn money. You Mm -hmm. can go all the way through our educational system and learn absolutely nothing about earning money. um, We're taught how to save it. We're taught how to invest it. But we're not taught how to earn it. And so you have um, brilliant people going around and they don't know how to earn money. Um, Yeah. Money is a reward for service rendered. The amount of money you earn is always in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there is in replacing you. Mm-hmm. But you take nothing with you. When you yeah. leave, you leave much the same way you come. I, I always say you leave with no hair, no teeth, no money. That's how you arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go a step further, Bob. I, I, I would even say within our school system, they don't even teach you how to save and invest money or how to open a bank account or any of that. People graduate from high school and know nothing about the law of circulation. They know mm-hmm. nothing about the law of receptivity. They know nothing about the law of correspondence. They know nothing about the law of saving and investing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get it. They, if they go to college, oftentimes they know nothing after they graduate from college. It's not a part of our our educational system. Mm-hmm. And it's you know, all, we, you know, there's so many people operate with limited supply. I love the way Troward put it in his uh, essay on spirit of opulence. He says, when you're dealing with infinite, you can never take more than your share. There's, right. There's uh-huh, one that's for beautiful. everyone. Right. Of it's inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. Yeah. Yeah. But then why are there so many people, and maybe this is a perception, but I meet so many. Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. Promise you joy in the mystery. Dr. Marissa, also known as the Asian Oprah. Her mission, to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, laugh, love, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Pay. Welcome. <laughs> you are tuned into my weekly talk radio show called Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Tuesday at naturally high noon out of the Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood, California on Universal Broadcasting Network. And then every Thursdays at 7 and Saturdays at 1 on my syndicated CNBC news radio channel KCAA AM 1050 FM 106.5 and now everywhere and all the time on iHeartRadio. And this is a show about hope and happiness and how you can be happy 88% of the time. So there's no gossip, no scandal, and no K-words, no Kardashian talk at all, and no CNN, no constantly negative news, because I want you to focus on your own reality show and how you can be the best that you can be. And so we have lots of different guests and topics to that end. And if you've missed any of them, I've had guests like Marianne Williamson, Marianne from Gilligan's Island, uh, Keiko Matsui, jazz keyboardist on Billboard, to Lisa Nichols a couple weeks ago, to Tony Tennille from The Captain and Tennille. Uh, I've got it for you, so please do go to YouTube if you've missed any of those shows and keep it tuned here. And today 
I am continuing my fabulous wisdom series with more wisdom teachers. And if you remember, I celebrated my 200th show with a fabulous, powerful panel of Neil Donald Walsh, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, and Bishop Carlton. And I thought I would follow that up. It's um, more than 200 shows now. Uh, with uh, two fantastic uh, teachers who you will want to hear if you've not, not already heard. The first is Bob Proctor, the Dean of Prosperity and Abundance Teachings, shows people how to understand their hidden abilities to do more, be more, and have more in every area of life. His teachings are primarily based on Napoleon Hill's Think and grow rich, and his delivery is second to none. For more than 55 years, Bob Proctor has focused his entire agenda around helping people create lush lives of prosperity, rewarding relationships, and spiritual awareness. As one of the world's most highly regarded speakers on prosperity, he is internationally known for his inspirational and motivational style. He's been interviewed on CNN by Larry King and on the Ellen DeGeneres Show and will be on CNN Espanol later this month month. And the second, Dr. Michael Bart Bernard Beckwith, no stranger to my show since he is my big brother, is the founder and spiritual director of the Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles, which is celebrating its 30th year. Three of his most recent books, Life Visioning, Spiritual Liberation, and Transcendence Expanded are recipients of the prestigious Nautilus Award. Beckwith has appeared on Super Soul Sunday, just recently. Dr. Oz, Again, uh, the Oprah Show, Larry King Live, Tavis Smiley, and his own PBS special, The Answer Is You. He's part of Oprah Winfrey's inaugural Super Soul 100, a sought-after speaker and meditation teacher. Michael's been the recipient of numerous humanitarian awards. Every Friday at 1 PST, thousands tuned to his radio show on KPFK, Wake Up. The Sound of Transformation. Please welcome to brilliant, fabulous men in my life, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith and Bob Proctor. <laughs> Good day to you, Marissa. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you, Marissa. Good to be here with you and Michael. Absolutely. And congratulations to you, Bob. One of the reasons I brought you on is because you are getting a fabulous tribute at Carnegie Hall in New York next month for your uh, many years of work. And I was just corrected. I thought you were 81, but you are 82. So you're a very good looking 82. You must use oil of Olay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hang around with old people, Doctor. <laughs> well, it shows. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's good advice. <laughs> don't hang around with old people. Well, I love that saying, you know, you don't stop laughing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop laughing. Yeah. So we do a lot of laughing here. So welcome to and uh, congratulations on your tribute. And both of us will be there in November. And we'll have a little more information about that later on in the show as well. We're giving away two tickets to that. PJ was kind enough to offer those to my listeners. So that will be part of the Asian Oprah giveaway later on the show. So you want to stay tuned so you can know how to win that. But first of all, I would like to, I know I usually don't talk about politics, but we're so close to the election. We're so close to uh, deciding, and, and Bob, you're actually Canadian, but I did want a, a couple of minutes to to just talk about, you know, we as uh, uh, people who are, are trying to um, <clears throat> encourage people to be the best that they can be. We're in America. We're also about, you know, nonviolence. We're also about uh, raising the awareness and consciousness of uh, spirituality and new thought and ancient wisdom. W what do you say to Americans right now who are either disgusted with both candidates, who are not knowing how to vote or wanting to, to be good Americans, not understanding what's going on? What would you say to them? Well... First of all, I think America is the greatest country in the world. I am Canadian, but I love America. I think America has taught the world uh, something about opportunity. It's the most generous country in the history of the world. And um, there's such great opportunity. You can focus on what's wrong with the election, or you can focus on the fact that they have an electoral system where anybody can run. And um, 
I think there's too much negativity in it. Mm -hmm. That's about all it is right now. But it's still, it's a, it's a free election. People can choose who they want. Mm -hmm. And I think America is a great country. Okay. I've always felt that. I've felt it for years. I remember one time many years ago, I got a green card, and I, uh, I was driving across the border at Windsor, Detroit. My kids were all small. They were very small. Um, I think the oldest one was maybe seven. And then they run five to four, something like that. And we crossed the border. We had all the papers. And they gave me the green card. They took and laminated it and gave it to me. And I was driving away from customs, driving into Michigan. And I had the most overwhelming feeling of gratitude. 